Hi again, everybody. This is Ariel Halevi with The Greater Context. Today, I decided to share with you an interesting conversation I had back in November with my friend and colleague, Simeon Atkins. Simeon is an industry consultant at SimilarWeb. You may have heard of them. They're a provider of web analytics services for businesses, and they certainly look like they are going to be a unicorn. In my conversation with Simeon, we discussed the importance of understanding behavioral psychology, specifically in the context of sales and overall customer-facing dynamics. This conversation was recorded back in November of 2020, and I'm happy to be able to share it with you here as part of the second season of The Greater Context. I hope you enjoy. Okay, well, hello everyone, and a very warm welcome to today's webinar. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us today. Um, so in today's session, we're gonna be exploring how behavioral psychology has a direct and a profound impact on modern sales. And we've got a lot of fascinating content to cover today. So first we'll be looking at psychology of decisions and some basic ideas around behavioral psychology to examine really what motivates us to make decisions. Uh, we'll then examine some outdated paradigms around sales. I think we all know now that the reality is making the sale is just the beginning really of the process and the ability for you to keep your promises and continued value will really shape the ability to keep your customers coming back for more and we'll examine what that looks like in more detail throughout the session. Uh, and finally, we'll examine the shift from a transactional to a consultative sales approach and the need to shift your sales approach from being one that's a seller centric one to one that's a buyer centric one. Uh, so before we dive in, quick round of introductions. So uh, my name is Simeon Atkins. I'm an industry consultant here at SimilarWeb, and I'll be your co-host for today's session. Um, for those of you that aren't too familiar with us, uh, SimilarWeb is a market intelligence tool that provides granular insights and data points into over 100 million websites globally. And what that does, it, it helps you give a, a 360 degree view of what's happening in the e-commerce market, which of course has never been more important than it is right now with the current pandemic as it is. Um, and with these insights, we support well over a thousand sales organizations to find, win and retain new business through a consultative sales approach. And it's that consultative sales approach that really goes to the heart of what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, I have the pleasure of co-hosting today's webinar with Ariel Halevi, who is senior consultant and co-founder at Viamar. Ariel, over to you. Thank you very much, Simeon. It's taken us nine months to get here. It's, it's <laughs> and one pandemic. And one pandemic. A uh, little bit about ourselves. Viamar is a boutique global consulting firm. We were established in early 2003. Um, we focus on two key areas to help businesses basically meet their goals while also ensuring personal development for their employees and general well-being whether it's strategic decision-making processes on the one end, uh, effective communication on the other. And the one thing that all has in common is trying to work out how do our brains operate in the modern world. Uh, we'll get into that a lot today, so I'll keep it short, but it's a real pleasure, Simeon. Thank you, Ariel. Um... So before we start, I want to go back to when Ariel and I first met. Uh, so Ariel was a keynote speaker at our company annual conference at the start of the year, which was uh, for many reasons a lifetime ago already. Um, so normally when you walk into a room of strangers, uh, I guess you'd be conscious of making a good first impression. Uh, Ariel, on the other hand, chose to walk in to a room full of strangers and dress the entire room as cave people, which is probably not the easiest way to strike, out, strike up an initial rapport, but it's something that's really kind of stuck with me. And Ariel, you might want to maybe try and make me feel a little bit better by putting some context behind why you decided to come into a room full of strangers and address us all as, as cave people. Well, first of all, we're talking about it nine months later, so I think that carries its own weight. It's still raw. Those who know me know I'm a glutton for punishment, but um, to be fair, I was addressing myself as well. I think that at the end of the day, when you think about our, our evolution and our development, we are very, very much still cave people. And this is something that that's, that's at the heart of the work that we've been doing at Biomar for the past uh, almost 20 years. You know, you have, you have these ancient part of our brains that have been evolving for hundreds of thousands of years in the very least. And they've been evolving to help us survive and thrive in a very, very static environment, generation after generation. And they've developed this ability 
to generate automatic responses that give us a competitive advantage to survive. The problem is, is that the world has changed and uh, the systems have not. And even though we do have a second system that's been developing, it's the later part of the brain that's been developing from an evolutionary perspective. It's also the last part of our brain to develop individually. So these parts, the amygdala, for example, the part of our brain responsible for the whole fight, flight, freeze response, that's fully developed by the age of 15. This is developed by the age of 25. So anybody listening to us today who has teenagers and occasionally finds yourself thinking, my kids are crazy, you're kind of right neurologically. And so at the end of the day, you look at this old brain and you look at the modern day reality that our innovative capabilities has created. And there's this massive disconnect where we now have a completely outdated operating system generating a million automatic responses every day. And those responses are no longer compatible with what is the right thing to do. And uh, Simeon, that's why I say we are all cave people. It's not meant to be derogatory. In fact, it's meant to be very respectful to where we came from. And if we can take these systems into account, as you and I will discuss today, we can actually get the best of both worlds. I think it's just fascinating and, and a little bit terrifying as well at the same time. I think our brains are hardwired for a very different time and reality to the one that we're living in now. And, and by the way, I feel a little bit less offended that you <laughs> called us cave people. So uh, that's fine. I think it's water under the bridge now. Um, but of course, what we all really want to know is how all this relates to how we operate in the sales environment. And maybe you want to kind of shed some light into where that kind of links to a sales environment. Well, you know, You've seen the slide before that I'm about to show. When we talk about salespeople, if you ask the average uh, person in the street, you know, what's sales? Or if you talk to people who are non-salespeople and you dare tell them, I want you to sell something, they immediately, you know, they, they, they don't like it. It's like salespeople are like lawyers. 99% give the others a bad name. And it's because this is, this is the stereotype of a salesperson. This is what sales used to be for most of our existence, right? What is this guy selling? So if, you know, let people take a second to try to figure out the picture. This guy is a salesperson. He's got this incredible potion. He is uh, going from village to village selling uh, this potion that will grow hair on your head if you're bald. And um, that's just not how sales works anymore. Sales has gone through a major uh, shift, just like humanity has now moved into a new reality and it has to adjust, so have sales. And there are four major paradigm shifts that we identify in our work with companies all over the world, which basically talk about these four major changes. And you and I, we're gonna be talking a lot about uh, the shift from transactional to consultative, but we're gonna be doing that as a foundation for the remaining three paradigms. So think about that guy on the horse for just a minute, right? He walks up to a village, he has a conversation and a transaction will either take place or not. And that'll be the end of that relationship. And when a transaction is over, whoever paid him money will have acquired full ownership over whatever bottle they bought, if they bought one or five or 10, which means the only thing this guy needs to know is how to close a deal. And the minute he closes a deal, the money handed over to him represents 100% of the revenue per customer per deal. That's not the case anymore today. Today, not only is it harder to get to a place where we close deals because the world is so much more complex, there's so much more noise to cut through, there's so many more options, the technologies are so, many more, so, so much more complicated to understand, it's more expensive to get to a point where you close a deal and even then you're not getting 100% of the revenue up front because you're selling today licenses, that's access, licenses, um, annual contracts, quarterly contracts, that's the name of the game in the digital revolution, software as a service kind of business. So now you have to retain your customers. You can't just be really great at promising, you have to know how to keep the promise. And keeping the promise means it's no longer just up to you. If the customer support, customer success, technical uh, implementation people don't do a good job post-sale, they're not gonna renew with us. And without renewal, there's no future. So this is a very, very fundamental piece that's important. Humanity has gone through a meta-historical transformation. And as a result of that, sales have gone through a major transformation. And that's how the two pieces connect. Yeah, and I really love this idea of the paradigm shifts because it really does directly speak to what 
we're trying to do at similar web with our clients or what we're providing uh, to our clients at similar web. I mean, if we take what we're talking about there about uh, transactional consultative, for example, um, the data that we're providing really empowers a salesperson to make that transition. So let's take an example on our core client base, which is payment companies. Yeah. So we're able to give insights into which their prospects are, for example, experiencing a growth in website traffic. So they're then able to understand which of their prospects are likely to be processing more transactions, for example. So more visitors to their websites, the, the reality is more payments they're going to be making on their website, uh, which countries they're receiving the traffic from. So they can start having conversations around cross-border activity, um, who their prospects competitors are and how they're performing. So they can start to benchmark their performance against their competitors, which which incumbents they're currently working with. So ahead of time, they know who the competition is they're going to be coming up against. Um, another kind of classic example of our core base are our ad tech companies. So again, with the data, we're able to provide them to see who the top advertisers and the top publishers are in the market, what marketing strategies they're currently utilizing and where they can come in and help, um, you, what the, the kind of key keywords that they're competing for. And all of this data really does help to unlock the door to having far richer strategic and meaningful conversations with your prospects. And I guess to follow on from, from that, based on what we were discussing so far, would you say now the emphasis is less about product expertise and actually more about customer expertise? Absolutely. You've just hit the head on the nail uh, or the nail on the head. <laughs> the other option is a little bit more dangerous. Yes. Um, yes, absolutely. You know, let's go back to that salesperson on the horse. He really, all he has to know about his customers is right there in front of them. They're bald, period. That's it. And as far as he's concerned, they're all one, they're all the same. He doesn't need to know where they work. He doesn't need to know about their families. He doesn't need to know much about them. In today's world, to be to really sell, you have to be consultative, and to be consultative, you have to completely change your approach from what it used to be. Um, salespeople used to think their job is to show up and throw up, so to speak, meaning show up and just share everything you know about your product. That's not the case, and they would speak for 90% of the time. Um, today, you have to show up and speak maybe 10% of the time, certainly in the early stage. And it's not only that you need to speak 10% of the time, what you say in those 10% actually shouldn't be at all statements and answers. It should be open-ended questions. And the questions should be about the customer, not about your product. And so really to be a great salesperson today, it's not sufficient to be an expert in whatever it is you're offering. That's actually secondary. You have teams of people who can help you with that once you've generated interest by the customer. Really your job is to be an expert in your customer. You need to know exactly the markets they're operating in. Um, what is their business strategy? What are their goals to achieve that? And to illustrate this point to me, and I'll share with you a concept which we call the sales ladder. The sales ladder basically talks about three key capabilities that are critical if you really wanna close deals. But I would say more than that, if you wanna retain deals, and ultimately, if you wanna turn your customers into your own advocates. So. You've mentioned it before, Simeon, salespeople, number one thing, let's know about our product. Let me, let me, Simeon, I'm going to try to pitch you this brand new phone that I just bought. This is a Samsung uh, uh, 20 Ultra. Um, I can tell you a million things about it. Look at the screen. I don't know if you can see because of my background, but the screen size, how thin it is, the battery life, the storage, I could go on and on. And that's what a lot of salespeople are tempted to do. It features selling. They, they're tempted to do it because in many, many companies, the very first thing they do when they onboard new salespeople is sit them in a classroom and say, let me teach you about our products instead of sitting them in the classroom and saying, let me teach you about our customers. The set, because of that, when a salesperson shows up to a meeting, he or she would prefer to talk about the stuff they know. They know more about the product than they know about the customer. So that's their comfort zone. That's what they're gonna do. What we suggest, is that you actually want to create a situation where rather than just be based on feature selling, you actually elevate to impact selling, where your entire focus is about the contribution, just like you did before, your entire focus is about the contribution to the customer. And only once you can verify and align with the customer that the contribution is relevant, then you can step down from the ladder and talk about the features. Ultimately, you want to get to a point where you can actually sell identity. So you and I, we kind of hit it off pretty quickly. And so it was pretty easy when we had our first conversation about maybe having a webinar together. We already knew we liked each other. You know, in the meantime, you had a kid, the world had a pandemic. We spoke a few times. Identity is critical. 
because impact selling is also very limited in range of time. What is your company focusing on the next one to two to three years? What is the technology that I have available to support that? Identity selling is about saying, look, I'll be here for you in 10 years. The world, think, think about companies who ended a big contract December of 2019. And then two months later, the entire world shut down. Even if there was a huge compatibility between buyer and seller, as far as strategy and solution, when the world turned upside down, the real question was, are you gonna be the right partner for me to call? Are you gonna be there for me when you know, everything goes haywire? And so identity selling is actually about shifting from person to person rapport to enterprise to enterprise rapport. And actually showing you that we are the right partner for you because we have the share, same business philosophy. We share certain core values. We have an approach to development. Um, there are certain tenants we believe in, the kind of people we hire, the culture we have in our company. And the higher you climb on the ladder, not only the greater the chances of selling and retaining, but actually one of the byproducts of that is the higher you are on the ladder, the higher you're going to be speaking to people on your customer side. And more and more companies are dealing with this challenge of teaching their sales force how to elevate from selling to mid-level technical buyers to high-level executive buyers. And that's where impact and identity come in. And that's a very, very important thing to do. You can't do that if you walk in just shooting your guns, saying, let me tell you about my product and dominate the conversation. You can only do that when you dedicate enough time um, and you slow down a little to actually pay attention to your customer and understand that it's now going to take a few meetings. They're in the focus. You're not in the focus and so on and so forth. I want to come back to what you were talking about around identity selling because I find that really interesting in, in, in a moment. But what kind of immediately sort of stands to stands out to me there, what kind of screams at me really is that everything that you've just said there seems to directly conflict with our system one or our, our cave person brain. So how the how do we get around that exactly? Well, first of all, we acknowledge it. And and again, you, you're, you're right on. You know, if you think about let's let's look at the cave people part of us. What were some of the advantages that we had to have in order to survive and thrive in this world before, let's say, 2,000 years ago? And I know 2,000 years may sound like a lot of time to us because we live maybe 100 years, but in the grand scheme of things, 2,000 years is nothing from an evolutionary perspective, certainly not out of almost half a million years. Speed over accuracy, right? Let's say you and I are in the Sahara or in some, I don't know, whatever, and we hear a roar. Should we sit down and have a conversation about, hey, Simeon, what do you think? Um, was that a mountain lion or was that maybe a, I don't want to offend any animals by responding too quickly and boom, that's it, we're finished. Um, so speed over accuracy was certainly the predominant uh, advantage. If we could respond quickly enough to the world, we would survive. That's not good anymore. Speed over accuracy is not what's going to get you through the door and to a contract with a client. Uh, number two, short-term gains versus long-term gains. We, as a species, never really planned ahead too far because it was too difficult. We would, have to, we would have to secure that we have food and shelter for the next day, for the next week, maybe for the next year, maybe, maybe. Today, we have to consider short-term gains as being completely insufficient. And the reason that's a problem, Simeon, is because it's not just difficult for the individual, it's difficult for the corporation. Think about how corporations are compensating their salespeople today, certainly publicly traded ones. You got to close your targets on a quarterly basis. And so you always see this major shuffle uh, at the end of the quarter and at the end of the year to get deals closed. That comes at the expense at a certain pace that is usually better for closing bigger deals. And so direct, direct conflict with our individual operating system and with our corporate operating system. So you're absolutely right about that. I want to pick up again, as I was saying, what you were talking around uh, identity selling. Um, and I want to give you a, an example of how I think one of our clients is using this to particularly good effect. And maybe you can kind of uh, clarify whether I'm on the right lines here. So the client in question is, is one of the largest logistics companies uh, in the world. Everyone will be will be familiar with them. Uh, they came to us because they wanted to essentially expand and deepen their relationships with their e-commerce prospects and customers um, and really move to becoming more than just, just, you know, becoming more of a strategic partner, I'd say, rather than just being another uh, service provider. 
So as part of this process, what they do is they they utilize the similar web data and they create these really kind of interesting in-depth market intelligence um, presentations that they'll, they'll show to their prospects. So that include things like benchmarking their prospects, market share against their competitors, what their marketing strategies are looking like, what kind of keyword strategies that their, their competitors are, are utilizing. And um, what I find really amazing about these, these decks is that you know, there's nothing in there that's really talking about what this logistics company provides. In fact, you can probably, you know, from what I've just said, you can probably gather these insights and, and uh, these talk tracks are, are way beyond what this company actually offers or even really can offer real expertise around. But what they understand is that this is important to their clients, it's relevant to their clients. And the feedback that we've had from them is that their prospects absolutely love it. You know, they going back to what you were saying earlier around, you know, the turn of the year now and everything that's happening with COVID, you know, people are so much more receptive now. The more help that you can give people, um, you know, and our salespeople are very good at that as well, utilizing um, you know, the similar web data, it's that old kind of saying, uh, you know, drinking your own Kool-Aid, it's, <laughs> it's sending insights to their prospects, you know, just because they want to, you know, they want to help, they want to, you know, they want to offer something that's beyond what they are, you know, what they're kind of talking about in terms of a product. And like I said, the feedback that they, they have from their clients is, is really strong. And in terms of cold, hard numbers, they've reported to us that they've, you know, they've seen a, a $5 million uptake since they've, since they've utilized similar web. So it's definitely helping. So would you say that's a good example then of identity selling, um, you know, thinking beyond what their product and services and actually thinking about what is going to be important to their clients and what's going to be helpful for their clients to understand as well? A hundred percent. I think it's a beautiful combination of identity selling and impact selling. When, when, when you're walking in in a transactional mindset, you're really very geared about how, what do I need to say to close this deal? And you're very, very self-centered. Again, this is very natural evolutionary wise. We're designed to be self-centered. There's a competition out there over resources. It's a dangerous world. We need to survive. That was true in an age of scarcity, but in, in the age of abundance, and I think there's very little argument here that we are very much in the entrance to that stage. Um, the company you're talking about did very, very wisely to kind of apply this concept of delayed gratification and say, you know, in, in scarcity, the more others have, the less you have. But in abundance, the more others have, the more you have. And this concept of win-win and of understanding that the more value you create for your customers, the more value you're going to ultimately get, even if it's not immediate, even if, if it's not at the moment of closing the deal, is very, very, very smart. And one of the byproducts, I believe, of what you're talking about with your company's case study is that by constantly exploring new ways of creating value for your customer, you're not only positioning yourself as a company that really cares and as a gift that just keeps giving, you are gradually uncovering new areas that generate land and expand possibilities for your business. And the next level after that will be skipping over from one company to another because it's got this domino effect situation. So very, very interesting concept, example that you just gave. A very, very good, very good example of saying, look, we're the kind of company that cares about you. We're going to continue investing in you. We care about your success and we will make money as long as you're successful versus I have an amazing bridge to sell you and I'll see you again in 20 years and I don't care what happens. <laughs> so I, yeah, I think that's a really great example. So if I'm not mistaken from what you were just mentioning there, we're starting to cross over from pre-sales to post-sales now. Is that, would, would, is that right in saying? Absolutely. And this goes back to the one of the four paradigm shifts we talked about before, right? Success is no longer measured by closing a deal. It's measured by retention. And retention by definition means that I have to maintain a high level of intensity of positive contact with my customer even after my deal has closed. And by the way, that's probably, I haven't researched this academically, but that's probably the, the origin of the evolution of the role of customer success or account manager is this understanding that it's not enough to sell. But you actually did a great job taking it even two levels forward because I'm suggesting that even before going the extra mile with your customer, you have this vested interest in making sure that after the deal has closed, your customer is actually using your product. The percentage of um, services and solutions and technologies that get acquired after an extended due diligence process 
and then almost never get used is remarkably high. And in the old times, you'd be like, I don't care. I, I don't care if he uses the potion to grow hair on his head or not. I sold him a bottle. I'll be back here in a year. But in today's world, it matters because when it's time to renew the deal, your customer is going to sit there in front of you and say, yeah, I don't think we need to renew. We never used it. It didn't really do any good for us. And in their head, it's going to be the product is not valuable. The solution is not valuable. They'll probably blame you, right? Because that's another evolutionary thing, right? Blame somebody else. <laughs> It's in our interests. It is in our interest to ensure that whatever our customers buy from us, they actually end up using. And that's the source of this concept called value realization and value recognition. If a customer doesn't fulfill the promise with you, if they don't realize the value of whatever you sold them, and that can only happen after the deal, um, they won't have a good reason to buy. And it, it gets even harder than that. Sometimes customers do use the solution do generate value from it, but never experience the value. That's what we call value recognition, right? And um, if they don't experience the value, they won't, they won't acknowledge it when it's time to renew. What's great about the story you gave is it, it, they went, it's beyond value realization, value recognition. It's continuous value adding support, which is very, very valuable. And so your relationship with the customer after the deal can be just as important, if not more important than the actual effort of closing the deal. Very, very important. It sounds like a lot of hard work and it probably, well, it is, we know it is, um, but it's clearly worth it. And, and I think I recall you saying that you kind of see pro professional relationship management as something that falls under project management even, uh, you know, maybe you want to kind of expand on that a little bit as well. Absolutely. I think that, um, well, first of all, it is hard work. I, I, I think that that's a very fair statement. And, um, I have not yet found a way of showing up to webinars with a magic potion of my own and saying, look, I got a way for you to work four hours a week and, and, and uh, never have to labor. But I will say that the models that you and I are talking about, the approach that we're discussing here today actually makes the work easier. Because when you do things the right way from the beginning, when you plan for accuracy that rather than speed, the amount of time and effort you have to dedicate to putting out fires is much less. The amount of resistance you'll deal with is lower, the amount of different meetings you have to go to because they have to convince this person and that person. And so it, 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 when you do it right, you, you still have to work hard, but you're gonna re reap many more rewards out of it. And finally, when you do it the right way and you're actually empathetic to your customer, one of the byproducts is, is that the work is more enjoyable. Because when the customer doesn't have to be on the defensive because everybody's trying to get through their wallet um, and they feel that you're an actual trusted partner, we'll talk about that in a minute, then absolutely everything becomes much more enjoyable. So you mentioned this idea of project management. Um, let me share this one more time with you. Look, um, when you and I met for the first time, when I got up in front of the audience and called everybody cave people, the risk I was taking was that the system one of their brain, you know, when we talk about behavioral economics, this is the field that has been championed by uh, two Israeli researchers, Amos Tversky and uh, Daniel Kahneman, Kahneman actually won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2002 for, for a model they developed called prospect theory. They basically proposed that there are two systems in our brain, the, the old system that's very, very quick and the new system that's very, very slow. And the, the quick system is a very, very basic system, right? It's a system that um, jumps to conclusions and makes very, very binary decisions. So when we meet each other, even people who joined our webinar today in the first few minutes, they saw us speak, they had either a positive or a negative response to us, period. That's it, very, very binary. And uh, so do our customers. Let's assume for a minute that we are able to make it all the way to the right part of the asset burden access, right? You're you, you emotionally and intuitively seen as an asset. That means that you are smack in the center of their comfort zone. The comfort zone is, is a, a psychological uh, concept that basically talks about all the conditions that need to be in place for you to feel comfortable and safe. If you know what you're doing, you're in your comfort zone. If you're surrounded by people you trust, you're in your comfort zone. If we can get to a point where we're in their comfort zone, anytime the world, and this happens every minute, shakes up their stability, they're gonna go back to that comfort zone and you're gonna be there waiting for them. Now, it's a journey. Get so, so let's say that you close the deal. That's great. You're on the right side of the access, but you're certainly not 
at the center of their comfort zone. You still have to go through multiple steps, which uh, we recommend these four steps, but this is obviously not an exact science where you move from provider to trusted advisor to business partner to opinion leader. And the reason um, this is so important, Simeon, is because the connection here is as you climb, you are also climbing up their decision-making ladder. And that's why getting into their comfort zone actually elevates your influence over them because the more they trust you, the more comfortable they are with you, the more they feel they've gotten value from you, the more relevant they're going to perceive you as being. And the earlier on in their decision-making process, they're going to want to invite you into. And that's very beneficial because when your provider, they're ready to execute, you're like, sure, we'll be happy to provide you all these materials. When do you need it? What do you mean, when do I need it? You haven't sent it yet? Like providers have to respond immediately. There's no response time because companies are always late in their decision-making process. But if I can actually get to a point where I can be invited into conversations that started six months ago, eight months ago, a year ago, I'm there when they're setting their goals. I'm there part of their meetings and salespeople can get invited to these meetings. Successful ones do, um, then it works. The project management part comes here. The, this idea that, you know, I used to, we have a longer session about this where I always ask, you may remember this in January, I, I ask, when I was married, what, did I have a way of knowing if my wife loved me? How would I know? It was, if, is it because she agreed to walk the dogs on a rainy Sunday morning when it was my turn? Is it because what? How do I know? At Viamar, we believe that all human dynamics can be measured. And it's not just us. We're seeing this now in the world of social media. And we propose, based on experience, six relationship key performance indicators that should be proactively monitored and addressed and prioritized in order to actually build a very good relationship with your customer well after the deal has been closed. Um, we won't go through all of them, but uh, we can certainly pick one of them. Uh, let's talk about the non-functional interaction one. Yeah, definitely. I was actually going to say that seems like probably the less or the least intuitive element here. So I think that'd be a good one to zoom in on for sure. Well, let, let's, do a, let's do a little experiment with our, uh, with our listeners. What do you say? Let's see how this works out. Let's throw out. it out to them. Yeah, absolutely. I want, I want you, everybody listening to us, I want you to please just, just uh, take out your phone for a minute. Uh, probably the first time you've ever been on a webinar where they've asked you to take out your phone. <laughs> um, Simeon, I want you to think about, this goes to everybody. I want you to think about a, a person in your life, not professionally, who's a friend, not your best friend, not a childhood friend, not somebody who saved your life or that you, you know uh, were in the army with or whatever. I want you to think about somebody who you met casually a few years ago, you became friendly and you dropped out of touch. So Simeon, you've now not spoken to this individual for three years. No happy holidays, no happy birthday, okay? So to everybody on our call, think about somebody like that for just a second. And now, I want you to write the following message and think about whether or not you're willing to send it to them. Let me be very clear. Don't send this message because I'm not explaining it. Here's the message. So I'm thinking about, I mean, I'm thinking about somebody called Jennifer. Um, please send the following message. Hey, Jennifer, uh, it's been so long. Time flies. I really hope you're great. Uh, listen, can I borrow your car this weekend? Now ask yourself, are you, are you good? sending this message. Simeon, what do you think? Would you send it? It had me squirming in my chair just the thought of sending that message. So well, no, probably not. That was certainly the, uh, the immediate reaction anyway. Simeon, somebody might argue that you're British, so it's harder for you, <laughs> right? I mean, Israelis are like, yeah. But I think generally we grow up understanding that um, relationships, meaningful relationships in our personal lives are not built around dynamics of, I'll call you when I need you. In fact, when you think about the meaningful relationships in your life, you think almost all of them, the people you go out with every week, you have dinners with, most of your interactions with them are what we would call non-functional interactions. They're not interactions designed to serve an immediate function. You don't need something from them right now. You don't need the car. You don't need a loan. You don't need a kidney. You just, you just want to spend time with them for the sake of spending time with them. And that's core to the human experience. That is fundamental to how we build friendships in our lives and how we build a sense of community and good neighbors and so on. Now, Simon, get dressed, put on your suit, go to the office, 
And it's as if you walked through a mirror and the reality in your workplace is a dichotomy to this. When was the last time, how, what percentage of the interactions you had with your colleagues or your customers or your vendors or your partners is non-functional? The last 10 emails you sent, were they because they emailed you and you needed something or you needed something or they needed something from you? Um, what percentage? Can we agree that almost all functions in the work, all interactions, are, so maybe you met them in the kitchen. Maybe you had something in the cafeteria. Maybe you were in the elevator together. So you chatted for an uncomfortable minute. But, you know, and that's why companies used to invest so much in offsites. But again, that happens like once a year. So what we are recommending in general is that you, you spend some time thinking about the non-functional interactions with your customers where you are actually investing in the person-to-person -person dynamic with them. We can take an example if you'd like. I mean, we can jump, we can like really illustrate this. Let's say that you know about your customer because you were in a meeting with them or you saw a picture on their wall. You know, one of our uh, senior consultants, Yaron, everybody jokes because he has a samurai sword on his wall. And now that we're doing Zoom calls from home, everybody sees it. So you know he's into martial arts. You know he cares about this stuff. Maybe, maybe you came across an interesting TED Talk. So you shoot them, you shoot them an email. You say, hey, I thought about you. I thought you would like, I remember that you're really into martial arts and I thought you'd like this. So I'm just, if we can incorporate into our dynamics with our customers, a, a process in which we really listen, we pay attention, we get a sense of who they are. We, and, and we pay attention to different comments they make about their family, where they went to school, their vacations. And we make a point of doing this we will dramatically improve our relationship. Now, this seems obvious to every good salesperson, but it goes entirely against the, 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 the pressures that we are under at work. Who has time for one more email per client per week or per two weeks? I don't know about you, but I end my day not having answered the vast majority of my emails. And that's just emails. I'm not even talking about instant messages. So it, it's, it's, it's a pretty big deal. So looking at these six KPIs, it really is a project. You need to monitor the KPIs. You need to check every one of them and consider how am I advancing this relationship? Well, like you said, a lot of work, but I think worth it in the long run, I think is, is what we need to remember. Um, so I think now we're going to hand over for some Q&A um, and we've had quite a few questions coming in. Um, so let's start straight away. So I'll start with one for you, uh, Ariel. Um, how would you structure your sales team's KPIs to optimize for renewals, keeping in mind that often the account is handed over to another owner once it's signed? Okay, that's, that's a very big one. And I want to preface by saying that even though I am sitting here representing what I would consider kind of universal truths, you know, very much in the meta, um, it always has to be somehow customized to your business, to, to the stage of your development, to the type of customers and so on. But here are a few things I feel comfortable would probably be relevant to most uh, organizations. A, make sure the KPIs include customer-centric factors. Like for me, a KPI is how much do you know about the greater strategic context of your account? What is the greater strategic context? It is the combination of two questions, the answers to two questions. What is that company trying to achieve in the next 18 months? Not what is your buyer trying to achieve in the next 18 months or what they're going to get if they buy from you in the next. What are they trying to achieve? Uh, Simeon, where does Similar Web want to be end of 2021, 22? We need to be able to know that. Number two, question number two, what is standing in their way? What are the key obstacles that they're facing? And don't be satisfied with answers like they don't have time, they don't have budget, blah, 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 blah. The obstacles have to be substantial. That would be a core KPI that every salesperson should have, um, as far as I'm concerned, certainly around the key strategic accounts. So people probably expected me to say number of emails they did, number of calls, number of meetings. That's, that's basic. I want the KPIs to be very qualitative and I want them to demonstrate a very strong customer-centric mindset. And to your point, uh, uh, Simeon, about keep in mind that they, they, they then hand it off, 
a salesperson who closes a deal based on having this information and then hands it off to customer success or delivery or something like that is actually setting them up to succeed in later being able to realize the value and create a renewal. So it, it's the answer could be five hours long on prioritizing. I think that was a very nice summary there. Um, so I'll go for one that's for me, I think. Uh, I work for a payments company, um, and although I see the value in discussing wider subjects than what we cover as a company, I'm wondering how I can discuss areas such as keywords and marketing strategies if I don't have expertise in these fields. So I think that's a really good question. It, it comes back to the example I was giving from the uh, logistics company previously about putting together these, uh, these market intelligence decks that are including elements that go way beyond you know, uh, delivery services that they offer. Um, what I would say there is that the, uh, the prospects and the companies you're, you're talking to are not going to be expecting you to be experts in keywords or marketing strategies if that's not what you do as a company. The point is that you are able to present this data that you can get from similar web in a way that they'll be, able to, they'll be able to understand it and they'll be able to you know, dissect from it what they need to. It's not that you need to go in and, you know, and suddenly shake up their entire SEO strategy. Uh, it's more about presenting that data so they can obviously take it and do what they need to do with it. And I, I know this is the case with the uh, with the logistics company in question. You know, they're not going in as, as experts. So um, it's going back to that idea of thinking about what's important and what's going to be relevant for your clients and presenting that to them. And it's thinking beyond what you you know are offering as a company. And they'll understand that and they'll know that you're not coming in as experts. But uh, I think that's a really good question. It's actually quite a nice way of clarifying what I was discussing before in that case study. Um, Cool. One for you, Ariel. Has there been any scientific research re released over the last six to 12 months that has changed your beliefs, opinions, approaches to the persuasion, to persuasion and sales? I think that's a nice one. Wow. Um, I need to kind of mull that over for just a second. I think that um, I, I can't speak to a specific what I want to relate to is the impact of COVID. And so I have not come across any scientific research yet about the impact of COVID, but I can say through a relatively large sample size of, of companies and individuals that uh, I have spoken with over the last nine months, what's really changed about sales is this idea of it has to be face-to-face. -face. We have to be in the room. If you think about um, how slow sales cycles have been because they were predicated on the assumption that we have to move from one step to another through a series of in-person meetings. And when you're selling globally, those in-person meetings mean travel. And the complexity of the scheduling is always relatively high. Certainly, if you're in a stage of the sale where your champion, your buyer, wants to bring in additional decision makers on their end, and now everything becomes much more logistically complicated, I believe one of the major breakthroughs we're going to see is companies understanding that sales processes don't require the people being in the room, but on the flip side, require a stronger emphasis on rapport building and trust building in the earlier stage. And that's why, even though I'm using a virtual background for, for branding purposes, I love the fact that people are in my house when we speak. They get to see there's a picture up there that my mother painted and they talk to me about it and we're in each other's homes. And so I, I, I can't speak of any specific research in the last 12 months. I do do a lot of reading about in, in areas of neuroscience, behavioral economics, but I haven't seen any major breakthroughs in that area in the last few years that I can speak to. But I can say that companies are rethinking their approach to the idea of travel as a prerequisite to sales. And they are finding, by the way, that they can save many, many millions of dollars while shortening the sales cycle by teaching their salespeople how to better engage remotely. And that, that breaks down into two pieces. How do I create rapport remotely before having ever met the individual? That's a big one that's worth discussing. We spend a lot of time working on that. And then how do I maintain the relationship afterwards? And in that respect, I think COVID will prove as a wonderful gift. I know it's a very cynical statement. I don't mean to be. I think COVID it, it has taken a very, very heavy price on humanity at large. But I do think this is one of the big things that the world of sales can benefit from is the ability to continue a process remotely without being dependent on travel. 
we've had a really good question come in actually, which is which really speaks to this consultative sales approach. So, uh, how can one utilize this in advance in a world where most first time contact is via cold emails and LinkedIn messages? Which is a, which is a really good point, and I think. Uh, Ali, I don't know if you agree with me, but particularly now with COVID, I think that people just don't have the time to sift through emails that aren't relevant to them or, or aren't interesting to them. So kind of being able to break the ice and, and, you know, kind of make that first contact has never been harder. And I think that, you know, again, going back to, uh, to similar web, having the data at your fingertips that you're able to integrate into things like outreach emails has just proved so valuable. You know, it's, it's all about doing the research into your clients, understanding where the pain points are that you can obviously help to address, showing that they've done the homework so the client understands that. Um, and I think that the other thing that you're able to do with, with SimilarWeb, which is particularly interesting, is that you're able to benchmark, as I was saying before, your prospect against their competitors. And the reason that that's really powerful in like an, e an outreach email, for example, is that your client is going to have insights into how they're performing, you know, where their website traffic is coming from, what the on-site engagement metrics are like, et cetera. But what they're not going to have insights into is how their competitors are performing. So if you're able to put a screenshot in with, you know, benchmarking how the website traffic of your prospect is comparing to three of their competitors, you know, that's a really good way of, you know, a great hook of getting their attention and, and starting that initial conversation. So, um, you know, you're absolutely right in saying it's, it's, it's particularly difficult now because it's hard to see people face to face. But breaking through that noise now where people just don't have the time is is, has never been more difficult. And I think that the more information that you have to hand that you're able to impart in your, you know, your initial email, rather than just talking about your product and service, um, you know, being able to actually really get to the heart of a pain point that your client is, is experiencing and then talking about how you can help um, is, is obviously very powerful and, um, you know, utilizing tools like SimilarWeb and understanding the e-commerce market um, is, is, is a really powerful tool at the moment and, and ways of being able to do that. Um, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that, Adiel, yeah, particularly. No, first of all, I want to echo the principle at the base of your answer, which is don't make your first contact your first contact. Come ready. Do your homework. Be, know about the customer. And it's never been easier in, with what the world has to offer. And certainly with what similar web has to offer, it's never been easier, right? So uh, think, about, think about we can reduce this challenge into four key steps that are fundamental to humanity. If you, we begin with you being a stranger, then you become familiar. Then we try to see if we're similar and then we can become allies. And how do you move from stranger to familiar? Don't reach out to them with an email before you found them on LinkedIn and maybe responded to some of their posts. Tag people in their posts, share their posts, look them up on YouTube, see if they have a channel, subscribe. Become a variable that they will have come across multiple times, even if they're not fully aware of it. So that by the time you're ready to speak with them and to reach out to them, the name they're seeing is not a complete stranger to them. It's actually somebody they're familiar with. It's somebody that they've seen before. And the minute our brain realizes that you're not a stranger, many, many defense mechanisms get eliminated instantaneously. So that's what, would I, that's what I would add to that. Uh, another one for you, Ariel, here. Um, can you suggest shortcuts you probably don't like that word, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. Can you suggest <laughs> can you suggest shortcuts to identify what the client needs when the client when the clients don't know how to clearly define it themselves? That's quite an interesting one, actually. Um, that's right, and that's and that's by the way, a lot of people think that the barrier to doing really strategic value discovery towards the strategic context that I talked about before, they think a lot of it is the barrier that the person doesn't want to share the information that they're holding there. Actually, the real problem is many, many times the buyers we engage with, especially if they're mid-level technical buyers, they don't know. Companies don't do a great job communicating their broader strategy to uh, all of their people. And so that's a very good question because if they don't know, how are we supposed to help them? Well, the answer lies in the advantage that you have as somebody who doesn't just work with this prospective customer, but actually has worked with other companies. Uh, find the common denominators and, and, and really spend time getting to know the insights that are residing under the ground in your pipeline and in your customer base. Again, that means you have to shift from a tactical approach our natural predisposition of moving from one opportunity to another and just tackling it immediately transactionally to actually zooming out, looking at the landscape of the customers you're working with, finding commonalities, 
and then coming to your customer and saying, look, I don't want to pitch myself to you before I know that I actually have value to create for you. And so there's a bit of information that I'd like to see if we can uncover together. And based on that information, I can do my homework and see exactly, are we the right fit for you? Now, if the customer says, I don't know the answers to these questions, you say, well, let me propose a few answers based on my experience with the 30% market share that we have in the market and tell me if any of this resonates with you. So what did we just do? First of all, we hopefully put them at ease, showing them that we're not just here to sell at any price, that we actually are committed to creating value for them, that we are entertaining the prospect that maybe we're not the right partner for them, which by the way, is good for both sides because if you're really not the right solution for them, you're gonna invest a lot of time and effort closing a deal. They're not gonna renew. Your renewal rates are lower. Your company valuation's lower. It's not good for anybody. That's short term. But the beautiful thing about this is that you've now, A, showed them that you care, B, sold your identity and indicated how strong you are in the industry, and C, you've already created value. By helping them look at their own needs and becoming, so now you're not sitting across the table from them trying to pitch an idea, you're actually sitting side by side with them together looking at their company, and you've just turned from a possible burden who's going to cost them money to an asset. You're another part of their team that they're not paying for helping them make decisions. So that, that would be um, my answer to that. I wonder if it's possible that we lost um, that we lost Simeon. I certainly hope that's not the case. In the meantime, I'll be happy to look at some more questions in the chat. Okay, so first of all, Devin, I'm looking at your question. What is the best way to introduce ourselves as a company who cares? Um, do you feel that the answer I just gave addresses that question, or would you like to, to have it addressed in a more nuanced way? I leave that for you to think about. Um, okay, so also the idea of, uh, did we get you back, Simeon? We've got me back, my apologies. <laughs> okay. Just so you know, the cave person in me was going crazy. <laughs> I can imagine. Okay. It's a good, good real life example of that. Exactly. So uh, I, I had just finished uh, giving the answer. So, um, just bringing my previous answer home, because it may not sound like a shortcut, um, it, it, cross-referencing data across your database of customers is actually a shortcut, because the alternative is actually doing a very, very extended in-depth discovery with your customer, which I'm still in favor of, but you can save yourself part of that journey by finding out the relevant insights that are actually in common to this prospect and other companies that you know about. So, Simeon, um, that, that summarizes the question about the shortcuts. Perfect. We've had a few more that, that come in, but I'm just conscious of time. So what we'll do is we'll reach out to those individuals after the webinar just to answer those additional questions. Um, but if we just go back to the, uh, here we go. So if we just go through a summary, uh, Adi, I'll, I'll hand it over to you to give a, a summary of kind of like the key points that we've covered today. And then what I'll do is I'll summarize to any of our clients that are on the call how you can take what we've learned today and implement this in, in a real life scenario? Absolutely. So I think the number one summary is we need to get to know ourselves better as a system. Human beings are a kind of a machine. We have hardware and we have software and it's quite remarkable how little we know about it in our day-to-day -day lives. So summary number one is um, definitely find time to learn more about the nature of how human beings make decisions. And um, there's a lot that can be read about that. I'll be happy to provide a various range of sources to anybody who wants after this webinar. That's number one, get to know yourself better. It, every hour you spend on it could save you 100 hours every year. Number two, uh, try to test yourself. If, look at your own sales process and look at your sales methodologies and ask yourself, have I really updated them to meet with the times? Or am I somewhat more close to that individual on the horse selling a magic potion? Um, and number two, don't just think about yourself as a solution provider. Think about yourself as a value creator. Try to constantly experience the world through the eyes of the future success of your customers. Live in the future. And when you've identified a good picture of that future for your customer and you've verified with them that that is in fact what they're looking for, 
then reverse engineer back to today and to what you have to offer and see, am I the right fit for them? And that also means don't go after every single deal. Try to manage your pipeline strategically and try to think about it not as a competitive dynamic of can I sell, but rather as a joint exploration of are we the right partners? And I think these three guidelines can really do wonders for a sales, sales organization. Yeah, absolutely. And I think from my end, we, we've obviously covered some some really interesting ground today that, you know, takes a lot of the out the box thinking, I think, um, you know, for us as salespeople. And I guess my key kind of takeaway, one of my key takeaways here is always remembering what's going to be interesting to your clients, you know, not just talking about your product and service, actually getting to the heart of what is important to your client. Um, you know, and, and the beauty of having similar web is the fact that you've got all of this data at your fingertips that you're able to present to your clients, even as we were saying before, if it's not necessarily something that you offer as a service yourself, just remember what's actually going to be interesting and relevant to your clients. Um, and don't always think that the next communication is one that's that's trying to make a sale, as, as Ariel was saying there before um, as well, and, and just try and come out of your comfort zone a little bit more when we're talking about. Brilliant. So from from Myself and Ariel, thank you very much for joining us all today. The recording of the webinar will be circulated um, after the call. So thank you very much for joining. I hope you found it useful and uh, stay safe. It was a pleasure, Simeon. Thank you.